So maybe to start, can you tell us a bit about the Jewish world, the Jewish life of your youth, and how that took shape in your own life as, as you came of age? Well, uh, my, my parents were uh, 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 typical uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe, uh, which is to say they were lapsed Orthodox. Uh, if they were anything, they were Orthodox, but they were not, observance kept getting attenuated as, as time went on. Uh, I had grandparents who were charedim avant la lettre, that is the word did not even exist, uh, and my maternal grandfather uh, always thought that 613 commandments were not enough. He used to make <laughs> new ones up, which he devoutly believed were in the Talmud, you know, or in the Shulchan Aruch. Um, so I, I mean, I, I was soaked. You know, my, Yiddish was my first language. I was born in Brooklyn, but uh, I grew up as a little kid bilingually, and uh, I, I think I knew Yiddish better than English for the first few years of my life. Uh, there's a story he's told to me that I, uh, on this, I was playing on the street when I was about two, three years old and speaking Yiddish and uh, some adults observed that Vera der Grine Jingle, who, who was that greenhorn kid. <laughs> so I was taken for an immigrant myself. Uh, I then, I was sent, uh, again, as was very, very characteristic, uh, the Jewish kids in that area uh, either was sent to uh, Cheder uh, uh, or to a yeshiva or to nothing. And um, my father successfully resisted the uh, pressures of, my, of his father-in-law uh, to send me to a yeshiva, for which I have been eternally grateful. Uh, but I did go faithfully to, uh, to a Cheder, which was, uh, you know, I don't even remember, I think it was, was it every afternoon or three afternoons a week? Uh, but uh, with a, you know, a Malamed, a teacher who was uh, 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 more or less the rabbi of the Orthodox shul that we attended. And uh, I, uh, because, of, <clears throat> because of my father's pressure, uh, I was, uh, I forget exactly at what age, I guess after my bar mitzvah, I was sent uh, to uh, Hebrew High School, Marshall Leah. I think it doesn't exist anymore, but it had branches all over the place. And so I went there for uh, all the time I was in high school. And uh, when I graduated from Marshall Leah at the age of 15, I think it was, uh, my father <laughs> again playing this role. He had had a he had had a heart attack and uh, uh, looked for a while as if he might die. And he exacted what turned out not to be a deathbed promise from me to continue my Jewish education. So well, I was stuck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the Seminary College of Jewish Studies at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And this, that was a, basically what today would be recognized as a Jewish studies program. Uh, classes were conducted in Hebrew. Uh, I still have nightmares of taking exams in Hebrew, you know. Uh, and um, there were very, very distinguished faculty. Uh, it was a five-year course, and uh, I graduated about the same time, I, exactly the same time I did from Columbia with a Bachelor of Hebrew Literature, BHL. That was my Jewish education. So how, how would you compare these two worlds, the world of Columbia, Lionel Churling, literature, the great books, the world of JTS, mm -hmm. How do they look to you then, and how do they look to you now? Well, they, it looked to me then that Columbia, the world of Columbia, was much superior. Um, and uh, in retrospect, I think uh, that was a foolish judgment. Uh, uh, but I was constantly on the defensive with my friends who thought well, I was crazy for doing this. Uh, by the way, it was tough. It was uh, two nights a week of four or five hours and all day Sunday. Uh, and uh, people kept challenging me very hot, with great hostility about why I was doing this. Um, and uh, I was, so this got my back up. And, you know, having grown up as a Brooklyn Dodger fan, 
you were allowed to abuse the Dodgers if you were a Dodger, but nobody else was allowed to abuse the Dodgers, and I felt that way about the seminar. <laughs> so, so I would defend it uh, with my literary friends and say they were great poets, and the Bible was full of great poetry, and uh, they never took it seriously. The, the one really interesting uh, event, L Lionel Trilling was the first Jew to get tenure in the Columbia English Department ever. Uh, and there were only a few Jews in the philosophy department. That was about it in those days. And there was a, there was a numerous classes. Uh, it was denied, but uh, the Jewish quota everybody knew was like 17 percent, roughly. Uh, and Trilling uh, also challenged me, uh, this was some years later, uh, about why I was, I'd spent so much time, wasted so much time getting this Jewish education, and uh, he said, what, 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 what distinguished has come out of the Jewish world, the contemporary Jewish world? And I said, you. <laughs> and uh, he was quite taken aback because he never, he was Jewish or his parents were Jewish. I mean, it was, he, was, he was Jewish through and through, uh, but highly assimilated, and uh, he never thought of himself. As a, as a Jew or a Jewish writer. So what, what drew you into the study of literature? What drew you in intellectually, personally? Why does that, at least earlier in your life, was that the thing that animated you the most? Well, as a, I mean, I, as a kid, I wrote poetry and stories. I mean, my primary interest was always literature, always. And there was no question that I would eventually major in English. Uh, I was. Uh, in high school, I published a lot of stuff. Uh, I was um, I was hooked on <laughs> on literature, and uh, at Columbia, you there was no actual major system in those days. Uh, you uh, I mean, you could you could take more courses in one field than, than another, but you were, there were a lot of required courses, uh, which was very good. There was a genuinely distinguished liberal arts curriculum. Uh, but I did concentrate uh, on English, and I, I, I was always writing, and I assumed that uh, I would grow up to be a professor of English, hopefully at Columbia. Uh, I got a fellowship to Cambridge, uh, the real Cambridge, the one in England, and uh, there I, as they call it, read English uh, under the tutelage of an, another great critic, uh, F.R. Liebes. And uh, again, I was, I was assuming that I would go on with this. I was going to get a PhD. Uh, the, my dissertation was going to be on Disraeli uh, as a political novelist. And because, uh, I mean, I was interested in Disraeli because he had been Jewish. And uh, I thought I could see things about him that hadn't been obvious to the English Tories uh, who, <laughs> who were his constituency. So why, why do you think, looking back, the Trilling, who's obviously this giant of literature and letters, seemed to have so little regard or little interest in the Jewish tradition, and you, one of his greatest students, uh, even then, at least had some regard for it? Well, there was a sociologist whose name I can't remember, who uh, Hansen, his name was, uh, formulated the law that what the second generation wishes to forget, the third generation wishes to remember. <clears throat> he was talking about immigrants in general. And uh, Trilling was very much of the second generation, uh, a little more advanced in assimilation because on the way from, I think, Bialystok it was, uh, uh, his mother stopped off for a few years in England. And by the time she got here, she knew English and was very snobbish about her command of English. And uh, she, she, um, she transmitted that snobbery to Lionel. Uh, he was going to be an English gentleman. And uh, he did succeed in turning himself into a reasonable facsimile of, a, <laughs> of an e English gentleman. Uh, some people made fun of him on that score. But it was not at all untypical for uh, especially intellectuals of his generation uh, to disdain everything Jewish. Uh, it was associated with the, 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 you know, the grubby East European world. Uh, and um, uh, 
Uh, now, Trilling also, when he was young, uh, there was a journal called the Menorah Journal, started in the 20s, and its, its purpose was to uh, uh, introduce or uh, establish uh, Judaism or Jew Jewishness as a respectable field of study. And uh, oddly enough, Trilling, as a very young man, worked as a junior editor on the Menorah Journal, which, uh, where he encountered a man named Elliot E. Cohen, who later became the founding editor of Commentary. So he was, uh, he, he, he was at least tangentially involved, and it, uh, I think down deep he was, he, he was secret, uh, intrigued really in wondering, he was often wondering, maybe he was wrong about this whole thing. Uh, uh, and I, I'm, I think I had a little bit to do with that. Uh, why I, I mean, I, I think it was really because of my father. You know, I've been reading uh, Hillel Halkin's biography of uh, Jabotinsky, and uh, about whom I didn't know. I thought I knew a lot about Jabotinsky, but I didn't. And one of the things I didn't know is uh, that how late he came to Jewishness, he, that he didn't, wasn't raised in Yiddish, for example. Uh, native language was Polish. But uh, Hillel's uh, description of Jabotinsky's relation to Jewishness, lahavdil, mutatis, mutandis, uh, reminded me of my father. Uh, that uh, before he became a passionate Zionist, he was, he was a Jew. <laughs> and uh, forget about as well, whatever I said, their definitions or ideologies. And, it, uh, and there was a whole movement in East Europe that thought that you could preserve Jew the Jewish people through Jewish culture. Uh, and uh, I think that was very much the tradition out of which my father came and got transmitted to me. You, this tension between the gentleman and the Jew is this Laurie a Samuel wrote a book right. by that is this title. A, is this a deep tension, or is this an accident of time and place? I, I think it's an accident of time and place, but if you substitute different words for gentlemen, you know, like uh, Frenchman, or, uh, I don't know, you know, anything... What about noblemen? Uh, no. <laughs> no, that would involve conversion. Uh, but the, 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 the tension... <laughs> there, there is a tension. Yeah. So. Okay, so what's that tension? But the, the, the uh, I would say from, certainly from the time of, um, well, it goes all the way back, but certainly for, for after the French Revolution and the beginnings of Jewish emancipation, uh, some such tension existed uh, almost everywhere among Jews, except for the very, very traditionally pious ones. Uh, and yet, and even some of the really religious Jews, like Moses Mendelssohn, uh, wound up having all his children convert to Christianity. And Mendelssohn was an observ was a highly, you know, was an Orthodox Jew. Uh, he had a reputation in, uh, in Germany as a distinguished philosopher, but he, was, he, he observed the mitzvot. So you took over commentary in 1960. Yeah. You were 30. Mm -hmm. So what was the magazine that you found? And can you begin to try to describe the magazine you created? Well, the magazine I found was, was a very distinguished uh, magazine, or certainly had been in its early years. Uh, I don't think there'd ever been anything quite like it in the history of Jewish uh, journalism. Um, uh, it, um, how do I describe it? Well, it was, it was a Jewish magazine in the sense that mo the content was predominantly uh, concerned with Jewish affairs of one kind or another, uh, with an interest in the world at large. Uh, uh, to simplify, the magazine that I turned it into was a was a general magazine with an interest in Jewish affairs. Uh, the balance shifted in the other direction. Um, but the, um, uh, the, the early, in, in its earlier years, commentary <coughs> had um, uh, not only a lot of stuff about the Jewish world, the Jewish affairs, uh, the internal politics of the Jewish community, but also uh, had many distinguished contributors who were writing about uh, world affairs in general, uh, 
John Dewey wrote for it, George Orwell wrote for it, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote for it, uh, and so on. Uh, and, and this was uh, this was new, I think, from uh, in the uh, in the history of uh, such magazines, of which there had been some, but nothing quite like this. I'm talking about even in Germany or other places, <coughs> um, and it had it, it was it was highly respected. Uh, it had a political slant, which uh, well, it had two sides. From the Jewish point of view, it was what they called non-Zionist. In, in this building, the American Jewish Committee was uh, non-Zionist. Now, what that meant was that it wasn't the American Council for Judaism, namely anti-Zionist, uh, but it was certainly not a Zionist organization, and it had distanced itself from the other Jewish organizations which supported the idea of a sovereign Jewish state in Palestine. Um, and uh, the, I would say from my own experience that the, um, the non was much stronger than the Zionist. I mean, there was a lot of hostility toward Zionism in the American Jewish Committee. Um, and uh, there was a famous treaty signed between <laughs> Ben-Gurion and Jacob Blaustein, who was uh, there's a statue uh, of him down in the, in the lobby who was the president of, the, uh, of AJC at that time, treaty, basically saying um, the existence of the State of Israel doesn't mean that uh, Jews uh, all have to go there or, you know, or, or surrendering their primary loyalty to the country, uh, America, basically. They were very worried about the uh, charge of dual loyalty in those days. But they were, they were against it on all kinds of grounds. Um, and uh, they published some very, very impressive stuff against uh, the founding of a Jewish state, some of it by Hannah Arendt, uh, for example. Uh, but there were others uh, who were, many of them German Jews, who were here. Uh, that was one side. The other side was that the commentary under Elliot Cohen was very strongly anti-communist. Now, there was a hidden agenda there that nobody would admit to, although within the AJC there was actually someone who advocated something like this, uh, which is to say to try to show that not all Jews were communists. I mean, basically that was the, uh, because there was such an idea and, with, you know, there's, I mean, <laughs> certainly not, not all, let's see, how should I put it? Uh, not all Jews were communists, but many American communists were Jews. And, uh, and there, of course, were the Jews in the, orig the original Bolsheviks in the revolution, heavily Jewish. Uh, and this was considered a very serious problem and a potential cause of anti-Semitism. And there was a man named Saul Feinberg who worked for many years at the AJC and whose passion was to push the idea that Jews are not communists, or not necessarily mm -hmm. communists. And Elliot Cohen uh, strongly believed that. Uh, he had been a communist briefly in his youth, and he turned against it uh, very uh, passionately. Uh, so the magazine became, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the intellectual community, uh, a, a, uh, a, a very strong center for uh, the, the exposition and embration of the anti-communist position. Uh, and it did very good work in that, in that, uh, in that regard, in that context. Uh, by the time I came along, something had changed. Because in 1957, you had Khrushchev's speech exposing Stalin's crimes. It was a gigantic event in the uh, in the uh, well, in the history of the world, actually, but it had a huge impact uh, on uh, on intellectuals here. And uh, commentary took uh, what I think, in retrospect, was an honorable position, but I was against it then. Uh, that nothing had really changed. Uh, this was all cosmetic, uh, and the Soviet Union was still a an evil totalitarian force that had to be resisted uh, and. Uh, in, the, in the world of ideas and in, uh, and in the world of, of, of raw power. Uh, and they would not, they, they did not yield an inch on this issue. And I, I thought that was wrong. I thought 
everything was changing. Uh, I was uh, an arrogant young kid, uh, arrogant to a fairly well, <laughs> and, I, uh, and I was convinced that we were in a new era and that I knew how to negotiate through that era. As a writer, I had, by the way, I had been on the staff of commentary as a junior editor. When I got out of the Army, I was, uh, well, we got to back up a little bit. I started writing for commentary when I was 23, and uh, I wrote a lot for it. Even when I was in the Army, I wrote a few pieces when I was stationed in Germany. And I had been promised a job for when I got out, and um, a lot had happened by then. Uh, but, uh, but I did join the staff as an assistant editor, and uh, that was in uh, the end of 1955. And so I was, uh, I was on the staff. At the time, these things were happening, the, the Khrushchev speech and the fallout from it. Um, and I, I then quit. Well, it's a long story. It doesn't matter. But, but by the time I was hired as, as the editor following the suicide of Elliot Cohen, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I had moved considerably to the left, uh, to the left of where I had been, which was a liberal. Uh, <laughs> and what drove that? Why were you seduced by the ideas of the left? Well, uh, <laughs> no, that's perfectly good. It's a perfectly good question. Um, as I say, I thought I thought everything had changed. That is to say, we were uh, we that the constraints and constrictions in, uh, of the Cold War on the on American culture, on American thinking. Were, very being, were, were being loosened and should be loosened even more, and that there was opportunity now for negotiations uh, with the Soviet Union that hadn't been present uh, before. Uh, there were opportunities for reform in this country that, uh, that hadn't been because, present before because we were living in a kind of frozen condition politically. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I like a like almost everybody who ever falls into the left, uh, was a utopian. That is, I actually believed at that age that we could, I wasn't so naive as to think you could be perfect, but I believed that there was a high degree of perfection you could achieve uh, if you wanted to, and, uh, and, if the, and if the conditions were ripe. And I wanted to, and I thought the conditions were ripe. Now, uh, I got mixed up in the late 50s, before I became the editor of commentary, with the, the nascent peace movement, which was then concerned about nuclear testing. Uh, it was a very tiny movement to begin with, although it had some very famous people uh, involved in it. Uh, and uh, I was also uh, uh, involved in, a, in an informal way with what got to be called the New Left. It hadn't, didn't have that name yet, uh, but some, what grew into the new left. I've often told the story, uh, it's worth telling again, the late Marion Maggot, who was uh, one of the editors working for me at Commentary, a great wit, uh, came with me. I, I, I was invited to debate somebody on, on Vietnam before anybody had even heard of Vietnam. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and we, we arrived at this Union Hall on 14th Street, and there were I don't know, not even this many people there. Very, and it was kind of a pathetic turnout and looking very scraggly. And Marion said to me, every person in this room is a tragedy to some family or other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and she was, she was, well, within 10 years, uh, uh, the joke was on us because they, they took over, and now they're in the White House uh, and, and Gracie Square and Gracie Mansion. Uh, in any event, um, but I was very sympathetic to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the idea that uh, we, there was a lot to be done about, there was the, the holy trinity of problems, war, racism, and poverty. That were the three things that had to be worked on. And, uh, and I helped uh, propagate uh, many of the ideas that were generated by the am am ambition to wipe out war, racism, and poverty. And commentary became 
sort of the, 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 the highbrow center of, uh, of, of the new left. Uh, and I, I say highbrow because uh, I rejected the uh, founding statement of SDS students. Who, I mean, you all probably don't even remember SDS anymore. The main, the main organization of the new left, uh, and Tom Hayden uh, wrote this manifesto, uh, which became very, very famous and influential. And he, he sent it to me, uh, thinking I would want to publish it. And I turned it down because I thought it was intellectually callow and vulgar. Well, uh, I was right, but that didn't mean it was not going to become a major force in the next decade, which it, which it did. But I, that's why I used the term highbrow. And so we were, and we were, uh, we were, uh, I would say, more intellectually sophisticated in our in our uh, formulation of the position of uh, of what came to be called the new left. So and you have to understand that the, in in its early years, I'm talking about the early '60s, late '50s, early '60s. It had not be yet become what it later became. Uh, that is, it, it was not yet anti-American, and it was not yet um, uh, violent. Uh, it was, uh, if anything, uh, inclined toward pacifism and uh, and and, uto and, and, and utopianism, uh, not uh, not the kind of uh, radical ideologies that it later embraced, and that drove me. What drove me out of that movement eventually was the hatred of America that developed and, and uh, became pervasive by the late 60s. So commentary became, you became, you know, one of the great critics of the excesses and errors of American liberalism. Yeah. So what, 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 what is this argument about as you see it? In the deepest and most important sense, what are the key fault lines in the, in the great well, for, debate uh, yeah. between American liberalism and What's become American conservatism? Well, uh, before I get to that, I, it's important to make something clear that a lot of people don't know to this day. The main enemy of the new left was not the right. I mean, the right was so self-evidently evil that it, you didn't have to waste any time fighting it. It just was off the radar. The enemy of the new left was the liberal establishment. Uh, liberalism. Now, later, it, everything got confused because as it got more and more powerful, it co-opted the term liberal, or it was the, the label liberal was, was pasted on it when, it, when in fact, the liberal, liberal had been a curse word uh, in, the, in the early days. Um, so the, 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 the fight that was going on was between these radicals uh, and the liberals, now, what liberals in those days were very different from what they later became. I mean, uh, if you uh, define, uh, if you if, if you try to define liberalism, the liberalism of those days, say in terms of the Kennedy administration, uh, it, it was closer to what Ronald Reagan ran on, you know, ten years later, uh, twenty years later, than uh, uh, than to uh, anything uh, known as liberal today. Um, it was hard, it, it was known as a hard anti-communist, uh, eager to fight the Cold War, defeat the Soviets, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, gradualist and reformist in its approach to civil rights and poverty. Um, so that was the that was the issue. Uh, the the new left there was no no issue uh, no issue in in those days uh, concerning substance. I mean, the new left was constantly attacking the older liberal establishment uh, for lacking the courage of its convictions. Uh, they, uh, what they said they stood for was sort of, was okay, more or less, but they never acted on it. Uh, and we are going to act on it. Uh, therefore, demonstrations and marches and that kind of thing, uh, which was something new as compared with the, with the 50s. Uh, Conservatism comes into the picture, into this picture, much later. Um, let me let, let me try to uh, well, let me try to talk about it in, in terms of how commentary developed. Uh, what came to be called neoconservative. Well, all right, there's there's a, there was 
there was traditional conservatism, which uh, was associated with William Buckley's uh, National Review, okay? Uh, Russell Kirk, uh, various others. Uh, and uh, th this new movement that got to be called neoconservatism, which uh, uh, made its appearance largely with the uh, establishment of, uh, of a magazine called The Public Interest. It was founded by uh, Irving Kristol and uh, who was his original? It was Dan, uh, Dan Bell, Dan Bell, Daniel Bell. Uh, and the public interest was uh, concerned entirely with domestic affairs, nothing about uh, foreign policy. Um, not that they weren't interested, the people who wrote and ran it, but but uh, it was for domestic affairs, and it was going it, it was technocratic. It was going to bring the tools of uh, social science to bear on uh, on political ideas and programs, and see if they worked or not. Uh, it um, it uh, took a strong position on uh, on the uh, what you call unintended consequences. Uh, this was in reaction to the Johnson War on Poverty and uh, the Great Society. Uh, many of the, those programs, the people involved in the public interest, had supported, uh, but were, uh, were uh, unhappily seeing them work out in, in a perverse way. And so they, they, they took it upon themselves to expose those weaknesses and failures. Uh, and they came to be called neoconservatives, um, and the difference used to be uh, uh, used to be expressed as, well, the old right uh, wanted to wanted to uh, abolish the New Deal, uh, whereas the neoconservatives uh, didn't want to abolish it; uh, they wanted to uh, um, uh, improve it, as ma make make it make it consistent with what would later be known as conservative values, incentives, work, uh, individual responsibility, and so on. Uh, and that was the, that was the first uh, fault line. The, the, um, the, <laughs> the liberal community, which by this time, see, it's very t tough to talk about this in short order. The liberal community, which by this time had been, uh, I would say, infiltrated and, and about to be totally dominated by the new left. Uh, uh, by the time, uh, not, not 1965, but by 67, 68, the word liberal no longer meant what it had meant in 1961 or two. It now meant, uh, in reality, the, uh, uh, the much more radical perspective uh, that came out of the new left. And that perspective uh, was, I think, uh, you can say without simplification, anti-American, that is, it considered America an evil country in itself and a force for evil in the world at large. And uh, it was, um, and the evidence for the, uh, for, for the evils extended all the way back to the founding fathers. Uh, this was, this attitude toward America, was America good or evil, I think became the main fault line between the left and the right. It got to be attenuated. I mean, people didn't use the word evil as time went on, especially when they got into mainstream politics. Um, but uh, the, the, the general attitude of hostility toward the country, I think, remained and, and remains, uh, even I, think, I believe in the Obama administration, uh, prevalent. Uh, the conservatives who uh, various factions uh, merged as time went on, uh, became defenders of America and what America uh, stood for. So now uh, the role of commentary, my role in, in this story, was to uh, bring the new perspective to bear on foreign policy. Uh, uh, it was commentary that introduced foreign policy into neoconservatism. Uh, and and uh, the commentary from starting in about 1969, 70, um, uh, embarked on, a, on, on an aggressive campaign uh, of opposition uh, to the left, and particularly to its attitude toward America and also uh, toward, uh, toward the Soviet Union. And it spent, we spent 
10 years really pounding on this, uh, on this, uh, on this set of issues. So I want to turn back to topics Jewish and Zionists, and perhaps begin with Zionism. Yeah. Where, where, where does Zionism fit into this intellectual history, yeah. this story? And if you were trying to describe your own Zionist worldview, its origins and its ambitions, what is it? What is your Zionism? You got a week? Uh, I got you know, <laughs> three or four good minutes. <laughs> I'll do it in two. All right. Uh, I mean, I was driven out of the left because I could never, I never hated America and I could never tolerate the anti-Americanism that was just all around me. Uh, and I, I, I began to, uh, I began to see uh, early on, almost the day after the Six Day War ended, that, that um, anti-Semitism was, which had been taboo since the end of World War II because of the Holocaust. Uh, was making uh, a, a return uh, in the guise of anti-Zionism, and by the way, through the instrumentality of the uh, black radicals, uh, and that um, uh, and that the fight for Western civilization uh, very much included a fight for Israel, uh, which was the soft underbelly of Western civilization, as we saw it and as I saw it. Now, the uh, you wanted to know about my own my own uh, personal implication. I was never I was like my father. I was never much of a Zionist. Uh, I went to Israel for six weeks in 1951. And I didn't like it. Uh, by the way, I spoke Hebrew fluently in those days, and I was perfectly you know at home. Uh, but I didn't like it. And uh, I was, uh, and I was certainly not anti-Israel. Uh, I just was not. It was not my my cause. Uh, it became my cause later, uh, because uh, it. I began to realize, and I, I I feel this way strongly today, that. Um, the 614th commandment. Uh, this was a, a concept uh, uh, developed in an article by commentary, uh, in commentary by Emil Fackenheim. I think I may have sneaked it into the article on, uh, myself, but uh, did I? <laughs> He'd remember. Uh, in any case, the, the 614th commandment was the commandment of Auschwitz, which is, uh, there shall be no posthumous victories for Hitler. Uh, and there shall be Jews. Uh, and uh, I, I believed and still believe in the 614th commandment, and I think it uh, takes precedence over many of the 613. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, at various junctures in Jewish history, going all the way back to biblical times, uh, there have been issues that uh, arose, uh, very heated, Heatedly controversial, in which the uh, the choice that was made did not necessarily seem to be the right one, but turned out in some Darwinian sense to be conducive to Jewish survival. Uh, the first one I would talk, is, you know, was the question of uh, sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, which led to the to the uh, forbidding of sacrifices anywhere else. And this, you know, there had been altars. Ancient, all like Be at Beit Ale, Jacob. I mean, the, the, that Jews had been or Israelites had been had been sacrificing. But and you would make a good case saying, why should it be only in Jerusalem? Uh, but it turned out that this was uh, uh, because of the subsequent history. This turned out to be the the uh, at that time the, a turning point in the survival of the. They weren't Jews then, but of the of the Israelites or the Judeans. Uh, later, there came to be the fight between the Sadducees and the Pharisees over the over the question of whether the oral law, the Talmud, the rabbinic law, was uh, uh, was uh, uh, revealed at Sinai and had equal uh, standing with the with the with the Bible. The Pharisees uh, said yes. The Sadducees said no. I mean, I think if I'd been around in those days, I would have been with the Sadducees. But where are the Sadducees now? 
uh, I mean, it turned out that, uh, that the rabbinic path was the path that was necessary to keep the Jewish people alive. Uh, now, and I, there are a couple of others, but I think Israel is such an issue. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Rav Cook, who was the chief rabbi of Palestine uh, uh, in the 30s, uh, once said that I kissed the ground on which the Chalutzim, these early pioneers, uh, 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 walk. It is holy ground. Now, they were, these pioneers were socialist atheists and very aggressively anti-Jewish religion, and that this, uh, this, this great rabbi could say such a thing, extremely significant, because what he was, what he was saying, and in defiance of the anti-Zionism of most Orthodox in those days, they were anti-Zionists because they believed you, uh, you, we were not allowed to have Jewish sovereignty in the Holy Land until the coming of the Messiah. Um, for him to say that, he was saying that the, the, these, uh, the, the, this is God's work now, whether they know it or not. They are, they are instruments of God's purposes, uh, unbeknownst to themselves. So where does God fit into this story in your conservatism, in your Judaism, and in yeah. the relationship between Judaism and conservatism. By the way, I don't know if I made what I just said clear, but uh, I'm just saying if you're anti-Israel, you're like the Sadducees uh, and, uh, and like the people who wanted to sacrifice at the altars in, in, uh, up in the north. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, you, and I think the Satmar Hasidim, for example, let alone the Nature Karta, are going to wind up as, uh, as, a, as a cult uh, separated from the main body of the Jewish people. That is assuming that we're not destroyed by an Iranian bomb, but... Uh, uh, so. so do you have an alternative theology? <laughs> in, a, in a serious way, well, how do you see the relationship between Judaism and conservatism, and where do ideas of the divine fit or not fit into this story? Yeah. Well, let, let me, uh, I, I will answer the question, but I want to back up a little bit. Um, uh, one of my favorite stories about, about God and, and Jews, uh, a, friend of, uh, a, friend, a friend of ours, an, uh, an Israeli novelist uh, who uh, was a communist in his youth, and his father was uh, or observant Jew in Israel. And, and uh, they had a heated argument one day about the existence of God, and it went on for hours, and the father at a certain point looked at his watch, and he said in Yiddish, yeah, God, no God, it's time to daven mincha. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and uh, this is a very profound uh, representation of, of the, uh, what I call the essence of Judaism. I mean, many people have pointed out when, the Torah was offered at Mount Sinai, and the people accepted it. They said, "Na asev and ishma." We will do, and we will hear. The idea being that we're going to, you know, you practice before you believe. And uh, there's a good. It's, it's one of the reasons that there isn't all that much theology in, in the history of Judaism. Uh, uh, it, that most most of the writings are, you know, explications of uh, of practice. Or, and uh, rather than of dogma or belief. And uh, uh, if you're asking me about God, <laughs> yeah, I, be I, I believe in God, and I believe that, uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that the Jews were the chosen people, and I am as angry with them as God often has been. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's your, if you were diagnosing American Judaism today, what's the diagnosis, and are there any things that give you hope about it? Well, I wrote, I wrote a 350-page book on this, uh, and uh, I, I, wish, uh, I wish you would all read it. It's called Why Are Jews Liberals? Um, my diagnosis, from, from uh, uh, starting with the politics, that, that, that American Jews uh, are overwhelmingly uh, uh, caught in what I think is a, is a pathological commitment uh, to a political creed that is not only uh, bad in itself, but uh, hostile 
to the Jews, to Israel now especially. As I said before, I mean, Israel is the key issue as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it doesn't mean I love Israel. I have often said I would, I would die for it, but I wouldn't want to live there. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, and for, Jew, for 70 percent of the Jews to have voted consistently uh, since 1967, uh, for uh, the Democratic presidential candidate, an average of 70 percent, including for Obama the first time, uh, when there was a growing hostility to Israel uh, in the Democratic Party, more and more open, more and more naked, and when the Republican Party and the conservative community in general were showing more and more friendliness toward Jews, Jewish interests, Israel, it was a real revolution. I mean, this had not been known before in Jewish history. Uh, but, you know, every animal is supposed to know who its f enemies are and who its friend, you know, which th that, that one is going to try to devour me, and this one is only eating grass. Uh, the Jews have lost the ability in America to, to know who their friends are and who their enemies are. And uh, it. Uh, it gets a little better sometimes, but I don't, I, I frankly uh, don't think I'm going to live to see a, a, a real change in this, of coming to their senses. I mean, some cata catastrophe would have to occur um, in order to shake most Jews out of this commitment to, uh, to liberalism in the, in the broadest sense. Do you think some version of Orthodox Judaism is the only viable American Judaism today? No. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have problems with Orthodox Judaism, too. So, uh, I, I'm... Um, you spread your anger widely. <laughs> <laughs> well, What's yeah. Wrong? So why, why not Orthodox? I contain multitudes. What's wrong with uh, it? What's wrong with Orthodox? Well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's rigid. Uh, it's... Um, uh, in many ways, uh, full of uh, full of uh, irrelevant anachronisms. Uh, you know, if I look, if you put a gun to my head and say, which which branch of Judaism do you think has the best chance of surviving? Of course, it would be Orthodox. Uh, but uh, you know, the conservative movement, which I knew at its, uh, when it was really quite vital, is now looks to me like. Uh, I mean, the Jewish death, conservative death movement. Death throws, yeah, the Jewish conservative movement. Uh, the reform movement is, uh, of course, very different from what it used to be. There's now a lot of Hebrew in the services, and they wear kippot and talasim, which the founders of the reform movement would have died if they had seen. Uh, it's, uh, but it, uh, it's still what, uh, what uh, I think it was Milton Himmelfarb who said uh, the uh, the... The reform movement is the Democratic Party at prayer, oh, or Democratic Party with holidays thrown in. Uh, so the and the Orthodox, uh, but but to the extent you take, as I said before, you take the Satmar, uh, and I think you know they they can observe all 613 commandments, and I still think they are bad Jews because they're anti-Israel. Uh, and uh, and I would apply that. That's not true of the Orthodox in general. Uh, it was true for a long time, um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I have no theoretical gripe with the Orthodox, but I, I don't see it as a truly vital source of of Jewish renewal. So you've written extensively on the Hebrew Bible. Is there a section or a passage or a figure that you think is most interesting, deepest, most inspiring to you? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, <laughs> one of the one of the reasons that I think the uh, you know the new school of archaeologists in Israel who say that there was no Exodus and that uh, King David was a brigand and uh, you know and there's no evidence that was any anything. Um, one of the reasons I think they're wrong is is that the uh, 
what's extraordinary about the Bible uh, as a national epic, if you like, is how freely it criticizes its great heroes. Uh, you don't find that in other national epics. Uh, uh, the heroes are idealized. Uh, and uh, I mean, King David is given a rough treatment, and uh, King Solomon even more. Uh, uh, so I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not particularly drawn uh, to, the, uh, to heroic figures. I am drawn to the ideas that I think underlie the entire Bible. Uh, and uh, I would say, Vachai Bahem, Velosh Tamut Bahem. These commandments are given to you to live, to live. Vacharta Bachayim, choose life. I think that would be the. Yeah, that would be my key to the essence of Judaism, choose life. Now, the, 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 the orthodox, and with considerable justification from the sources, uh, uh, take that to mean uh, the more observant you are of the mitzvot, uh, the more life you have, uh, the better life you have. Um, I don't interpret it that way, necessarily. Uh, I, I interpret it as meaning that there is a there is a natural moral order, just as there is a natural physical order. It's a form of natural law thinking, uh, and that um, and that if you live by the laws, uh, by the moral laws of the universe, uh, of, of the world, of life, uh, you'll have uh, the best life there is to live. And those laws can be discerned by reason alone, or not? I mean, are they dependent well, on the revelations of the Bible? Well, uh, in the end, uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't think. I think in the end, uh, faith is is what care God is a leap. Uh, you can't arrive at uh, at a, a belief in God uh, just through reason alone. But I think you can, through reason alone, uh, arrive at some understanding of what the existence of God entails. So you've described the struggle with radical Islam as World War IV. What's the state of this war as you see it? And what do you think the Middle East and Israel will look like in 10 years? Well, the state of the war is not good. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, uh, we're, it's <coughs> After how many years is it? Not, uh, Eleven. This is uh, how many years is it? Uh, from uh, 2000, what, 13, 13 years. Right? 13 years. Uh, we're still officially not afraid to name the enemy, uh, and uh, it's, it's a war being fought against us by an enemy uh, whose name we refuse to use, uh, and it leads to confusion and uh, and uh, and uh, errors of of. of of strategy, of tactics, of everything. Uh, the, the, so it's not going well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, somebody was doing something right because uh, almost everybody expected that we would have been attacked again by now, and we haven't, thank God. So um, I compare it in, in my book on World War IV to uh, the, the Cold War. I mean, I see it as a war that's going to last for 40 years or thereabouts, and that will involve uh, the use of many different instrumentalities of power, military, diplomatic, political, economic, and that uh, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, have its low points and high points. I mean, people think the Cold War, we, we, everybody was on the same side. We all knew who the enemy was. We were all together. Of course, we weren't all together. I mean, there were huge fights, not unlike the ones we're having now about what to do and what was, and what was the right course to take. Uh, I, I find it impossible to believe that we won't in the end win this war. Uh, but uh, it's going to take a long time. And we're going to have to get rid of uh, the likes of Obama. As you look back on your distinguished, uh, very important career as a public intellectual, biggest regret, biggest source of pride. And second, uh, you, you were born as a literary critic in some ways. What, what do you think is the greatest work of literature ever written? 
Oh, the greatest work of, that, that, well, that's easy. I mean, uh, about five of Shakespeare's plays. Um, I can tell you the greatest piece, piece of music what, ever written. What makes Shakespeare's plays so great, as you see it? What's the source of their excellence? Well, he, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know that I can uh, summarize it in a sentence. I mean, I'll give you two. Shakespeare knew everything. Uh, he was capable of the most sublime articulation of, the, of all the things he knew. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's been no one who has equaled him in either breadth or depth uh, or beauty in the history of literature. I think the greatest single piece of music ever written is Bach's St. Matthew Passion. Why? I just throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, because it is. <laughs> oh, you were asking me, oh, about... Uh, regrets and source of pride. Je ne regrette uh, rien. And, and. <laughs> I can tell you my source of pride. Uh, I said it at my uh, the, the dinner for my retirement. Uh, my, my greatest source of pride has been that I have been able to defend my country that is the United States, and my people, that is the Jews, uh, against their enemies in the, in the world of ideas, uh, and uh, that uh, I've been able to do so, uh, uh, I, I would say, with some effectiveness. Um, I can't, it's hard for me to regret, I mean, some of the bad things I did uh, were necessary preludes to some of the good things I did. <laughs> I, I would not have been able to do the good things. If I, if I hadn't been on the left and inside, I would never really have known uh, the enemy as well as I got to know the enemy that way. So uh, I've said a lot about that in my, another book of mine, Ex-Friends. So. Uh, but but the, the source of pride, no question. I mean, to have to have been able to defend the uh, America and the, and the Jews against the common enemy uh, in a time of, uh, of, of great danger uh, is, is is the uh, is the proudest of my achievements. And uh, I'm uh, I'm very 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 worried about Iran now. Uh, and I've been, uh, I, I can say I'm proud of the fact that I have been uh, calling attention to this danger for about seven years now. And I've been saying for seven years now that only military action will prevent them from getting the bomb. And I think that's been pretty well vindicated. Norman, we thank you. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs>